An excerpt from The Roots of Coincidence by Arthur Kessler, narrated by Joseph Vobel. Chapter 3, Seriality and Synchronicity, Section 1. Commerer was a Lamarckian. He believed in the inheritance of acquired characteristics, that the skills and improvements in physique acquired by the parents are to some extent inherited by their offspring. As against this, the orthodox neo-Darwinian theory holds that acquired characteristics do not affect the genes, carriers of the hereditary blueprint. Evolution is the outcome of random mutations in the genetic material retained by natural selection. The Lamarckian view is philosophically more attractive because it regards evolution as the cumulative effect of the virtues and strivings of successive generations. Whereas in the Darwinian view, these efforts are wasted. Each generation must start from scratch, as it were, and evolution is the result of blind chance and selective pressures. But the Lamarckians have never been able to produce experimental evidence of the inheritance of acquired characteristics. Lamarckism went out of fashion at the beginning of the century and came to be regarded as a heresy. Commerer was the last Lamarckian of European fame. He spent most of his life trying to demonstrate the inheritance of acquired characters in reptiles, amphibians, and even in sea squirts. But his experimental animals perished in the First World War, and his last preserved specimen, a so-called midwife toad, Alitus obstetricans, was found to have been tampered with to fake the evidence. A few weeks after this disclosure, his reputation ruined, Kammer shot himself on an Austrian mountain. I have for many years been fascinated by this extraordinary personality and have recently written his biography, The Case of the Midwife Toad, London, 1971, which I believe contains strong evidence indicating that the forgery was committed without his knowledge by a different person. In the present context, however, we are concerned not with Kammerer's Lamarckian views, though I shall briefly return to them later on, but with a second heresy to which he was committed, his belief in the significance of apparent coincidences. He published his theory on the subject in 1919 in a remarkable work, Das Gassetz der Serie, The Law of Seriality. No English translation exists to date. I have given a summary of the book in Appendix 1 of The Case of the Midwife Toad, and must apologize for repeating some passages from it. The interested reader can find that appendix narrated on this channel. Kammerer kept a logbook of coincidences from the age of 20 to 40. He was not the only one to indulge in this secret vice. Young, for instance, did the same. I have often come up against the phenomena in question, Young wrote and could convince myself how much these inner experiences meant to my patient. In most cases, they were things which people do not talk about for fear of exposing themselves to thoughtless ridicule. I was amazed to see how many people have had experiences of this kind and how carefully the secret was guarded. Kammerer's book contains a hundred samples of coincidences. For instance, on September 18, 1916, my wife, while waiting for her turn in the consulting room of Professor Dr. J. V. H., reads the magazine Die Kunst. She is impressed by some reproductions of pictures by a painter named Schwalbach and makes a mental note to remember his name because she would like to see the originals. At that moment, the door opens and the receptionist calls out to the patients, Is Frau Schwalbach here? She is wanted on the telephone. Another instance. On July 28, 1915, I experienced the following progressive series. A. My wife was reading about Mrs. Rohan, a character in the novel Michael by Herman Bang. In the tramway, she saw a man who looked like her friend, Prince Joseph Rohan. In the evening, Prince Rohan dropped in on us. B. In the tram, she overheard somebody asking the pseudo-Rohan whether he knew the village of Weisenbach on Lake Attersee and whether it would be a pleasant place for a holiday. 
When she got out of the tram, she went to the delicatessen shop on the Noskmarkt, where the attendant asked her whether she happened to know Weisenbach on Lake Attersee. He had to make a delivery by mail and did not know the correct postal address. Most of his other examples are even more trivial. Thus, he records that on November 4th, 1910, his brother-in-law went to a concert where he had seat number nine and cloak room ticket number nine. The next day at another concert, he had seat number 21 and cloak room ticket number 21. Camera calls this a series of the second order because the same type of coincidence occurred on two successive days and comments, quote, we shall soon see that such clusterings of series of the first order into series of the second or nth order are common, almost regular occurrences, end quote. It is indeed commonly believed that coincidences tend to come in series. Gamblers have lucky days and vice versa. It never rains, but it pours. Hence the title of the book, Das Gassetz der Serie. He defines a serie as, quote, a lawful recurrence of the same or similar things and events, a recurrence or clustering in time or space, whereby the individual members in the sequence, so far as can be ascertained by careful analysis, are not connected by the same active cause, end quote. The expression lawful recurrence may give the impression that the series is governed by causal laws. But Kammerer's purpose is to prove just the opposite, that coincidences, whether they come singly or in series, are manifestations of a universal principle in nature which operates independently from physical causation. The laws of seriality are, in Kammerer's view, as fundamental as those of physics, but as yet unexplored. Moreover, single coincidences are merely tips of the iceberg which happened to catch our eye, because in our traditional ways we tend to ignore the ubiquitous manifestations of seriality. The first half of Kammerer's book is devoted to the classification of coincidental series, which he undertook with the meticulousness of a zoologist devoted to taxonomy. There is a typology of non-causal concurrences related to numbers, names, situations, etc. After this comes a chapter on the morphology of series, which are classified according to their order, the number of successive coincidences, their power, number of parallel coincidences, and their parameters, number of shared attributes. Commerce spent hours sitting on benches in various public parks, noting down the numbers of people that strolled by in both directions, classifying them by sex, age, dress, whether they carried umbrellas or parcels. He did the same on his long tram journeys from suburb to laboratory. Then he analyzed his tables and found that on every parameter, they showed the typical clustering phenomena familiar to statisticians, gamblers, and insurance companies. He made the necessary allowances for such causal factors as rush hour, weather, etc. At the end of this classificatory part of the book, Hammer concluded, So far we have been concerned with the factual manifestations of recurrent series. Without attempting an explanation, we have found that the recurrence or identical or similar data in contiguous areas of space or time is a simple empirical fact which has to be accepted and which cannot be explained by coincidence, or rather, which makes coincidence rule to such an extent the concept of coincidence itself is negated. In the second theoretical part of the book, Kammer develops his central idea that coexistent with causality, there is an a-causal principle active in the universe, which tends towards unity. In some respects, it is comparable to universal gravity, which to the physicist is also still a mystery. But unlike gravity, which acts on all mass indiscriminately, this force acts selectively on form and function to bring similar configurations together in space and time. It correlates by affinity, by which means this a-causal agency intrudes into the causal order of things, both in dramatic and trivial ways we cannot tell, since it functions ex hypothesi, outside the known laws of physics. In space it produces concurrent events related by affinity, in time similarly related series. 
Quote, we thus arrive at the image of a world mosaic or cosmic kaleidoscope, which, in spite of constant shufflings and rearrangements, also takes care of bringing like and like together. End quote. Kammer was particularly interested in temporal series of recurrent events. These he regarded as cyclic processes, which propagate themselves like waves along the time axis of the space-time continuum. But we are aware only of the crests of the waves, which appear to us as isolated coincidences, while the troughs remain unnoticed. He thus reverses the skeptic's argument that out of the multitude of random events, we only pick those which are significant. The cycles may be caused either by causal factors, in other words, planetary motion, or patterned by seriality, as the lucky runs of gamblers. He devotes a chapter to previous theories of periodicity, from the Pythagoreans' magic seven to Goethe's revolving circles of good and bad days, up to Freud, who believed in cycles of 23 and 27 days, which somehow combined to produce the data of significant events. At the end of the book, Kammer expresses his belief that seriality is, quote, ubiquitous and continuous in life, nature, and cosmos. It is the umbilical cord that connects thought, feeling, science, and art with the womb of the universe which gave birth to them. End quote. Some of the chapters in the book, particularly those dealing with physics, contain naive errors. Others show tantalizing flashes of intuition. I have compared its effect to that of an impressionist painting, which has to be viewed from a distance. If one puts one's nose into it, the details turn into clumsy blobs. While thus the theoretical part can hardly stand up to critical scrutiny, this first attempt at a systematic classification of coincidental events may find some unexpected applications at some future date. These things happen in science. It may also be the reason why Einstein gave a favorable opinion of the book. He called it, quote, original and by no means absurd, end quote. Quoted by H. Prisebrom, Paul Kammerer, Als Biologie, November 1926. He may have remembered that the non-Euclidean geometries invented by earlier mathematicians more or less as a game provided the basis for his relativistic cosmology. Section 2. Another great physicist whose thoughts moved in a similar direction was Wolfgang Pauli. At the end of the 1932 conference on nuclear physics in Copenhagen, the participants, as was their custom on these occasions, performed a skit full of that quantum humor of which we have already had a few samples. In that particular year, they produced a parody of Goethe's Faust, in which Wolfgang Pauli was cast in the role of Mephistopheles. His Gretchen was the neutrino, whose existence Pauli had predicted, but which had not yet been discovered. Mephistopheles to Faust. Beware, beware of reason and of science, man's highest powers, unholy in alliance. You'll let yourself, through dazzling witchcraft, yield to weird temptations of the quantum field. Enter Gretchen, she sings to Faust, melody, Gretchen at the spinning wheel by Schubert, Gretchen. My rest mast is zero, my charge is the same. You are my hero, Neutrino's my name. Well, but Pauli really was a kind of Mephistopheles among the sorcerers of Copenhagen. Years earlier, he had produced by a brilliant sleight of hand one of the key concepts of modern physics, the Pauli exclusion principle, which says, roughly speaking, that only one electron at a time can occupy any planetary orbit inside an atom. Asterisk, more precisely, that in a neutral atom, no two electrons can have the same set of quantum numbers. The exclusion principle was a purely mathematical construct for which no justification in terms of physical causation could be invoked, except the fact that without it, quantum theory made no sense. The professor of physics at Yale commented, Men in theoretical physics today invoke a principle known as the exclusion principle. It was discovered by Pauli. It is responsible for most of the organizing actions that occur in nature. All of these are brought about by the Pauli principle, which is simply a principle of symmetry, a formal mathematical characteristic of the equations which in the end regulate phenomena in nature. Almost miraculously, it calls into being what we call exchange forces, the forces which bind atoms into molecules and molecules into crystals. It is responsible for the fact that iron can be magnetized, 
that matter cannot be squeezed together into an arbitrarily small volume. The impenetrability of matter, its very stability, can be directly traced to the Pauli exclusion principle. Now, this principle has no dynamic aspect to it at all. It acts like a force, although it is not a force. We cannot speak of it as doing anything by mechanical action. No, it is a very general and elusive thing, a mathematical symmetry imposed upon the basic equations of nature. Pauli shared Commer's and Young's belief in non-causal, non-physical forces operating in nature. Even the exclusion principle, quote, acts like a force although it is not a force, end quote. He probably had a more profound insight than his fellow sorcerers into the limitations of science. When he was 50, he wrote a penetrating study on the emergence of science from mysticism, as reflected in the ideas of Johannes Kepler, who was both a mystic and the founder of modern astronomy, asterisk. CF, my biography of Kepler in The Sleepwalkers and the analysis, which is very close to Pauli's, of his intellectual development in my article on Kepler in the Encyclopedia of Philosophy, and asterisk. The essay is called The Influence of Archetypical Ideas on the Scientific Theories of Kepler and originally appeared in a series of monographs published by the Young Institute in Zurich. It was a highly unusual enterprise for a modern scientist to engage in this kind of writing and to have it printed in a psychological journal. Towards the end of his essay, Pauli says, quote, Today we have the natural sciences, but no longer a philosophy of science. Since the discovery of the elementary quantum, Physics was obliged to renounce its proud claim to be able to understand in principle the whole of the world. But this predicament may contain the seed of further developments, which will correct the previous one-sided orientation, and will move towards a unitary worldview in which science is only a part in the whole." End quote. This kind of philosophical doubt about the meaning of it all is not unusual among scientists when they get over 50. One might also call it the rule. Hence the galaxy of FRSs and Nobel laureates in the Society for Psychical Research's role of honor. But Pauli went further than devising physicalistic theories to explain ESP in causal terms. He felt that this was hopeless and that it was preferable and more honest to accept that parapsychological phenomena, including apparent coincidences, were the visible traces of untraceable acausal principles in the universe. This provided the basis for his collaboration with Jung. Section 3. Jung used Pauli, so to speak, as a tutor in modern physics. Jung had experimented in parapsychology and spiritualism from his early days as a student of medicine to the end of his life. He refused, quote, to commit the fashionable stupidity of regarding everything I cannot explain as a fraud, end quote. In his early 20s, he organized regular spiritualistic seances. In the course of one of these, a heavy walnut table, an old heirloom, split with a loud report. And soon afterwards, a bread knife in a drawer inexplicably snapped into four parts, again with a sound like a pistol shot. The four pieces of the knife are still in the possession of the Young family. In his memoirs, Jung relates a famous episode which took place when, in 1909, he visited Freud in Vienna during the honeymoon of their collaboration. The break was to come three years later. Jung wanted to know Freud's opinion on ESP. Freud at the time rejected it, although in later years he changed his mind. Jung narrates, While Freud was going on this way, I had a curious sensation. It was as if my diaphragm was made of iron and was becoming red hot, a glowing vault. And at the moment, there was such a loud report in the bookcase, which stood right next to us, that we both started up in alarm, fearing the thing was going to topple over us. I said to Freud, There, that is an example of a so-called catalytic exteriorization phenomenon. Oh, come, he explained, that is sheer bosh. It is not, I replied. You are mistaken, Herr Professor. And to prove my point, I now predict that in a moment there will be another loud report. Sure enough, no sooner than I had said the words than the same detonation went off in the bookcase. To this day I do not know what gave me this certainty, but I know, beyond all doubt, that the rapport would come again. Freud only stared aghast at me. I do not know what was in his mind or what his look meant. In any case, this incident aroused his mistrust of me, and I had the feeling that I had done something against him. I never afterwards discussed the incident with him. 
Though he experimented with mediums, Jung initially drew the line at ghosts. In a lecture to the English Society for Psychical Research in 1919, he explained apparitions and apparent materializations as, quote, unconscious projections or exteriorizations. I, for one, am certainly convinced that there are exteriorizations. I have repeatedly observed the telepathic effects of unconscious complexes and also a number of parapsychic phenomena, but in all this I see no proof whatever of the existence of real spirits, and until such proof is forthcoming, I must regard this whole territory as an appendix of psychology. How an exteriorization of an emotional state could produce the detonations in Freud's bookcase remained for the time being an unresolved question. But the next year, Jung met a real ghost in England, of course. He described the event in a little-known anthology. He spent several weekends in a country house in Buckinghamshire, which a friend had recently rented. During several nights, he heard all sorts of noises, the dripping of water, rustlings, knockings, which increased in intensity until during the fifth weekend, he thought somebody outside was knocking at the wall with a sledgehammer. Quote, I had the feeling of a close presence. I opened my eyes with an effort. Then I saw lying next to my head on the pillow the head of an old woman whose right eye, wide open, was staring at me. The left half of her face, including the eye, was missing. I leapt out of bed and lit a candle. Thereupon, the head vanished, end quote. Later on, Young and his host discovered that the whole village knew the house was haunted. It was torn down soon after. Young seemed to have been pursued by this kind of experience all his life. Some of his patients, too, became susceptible to them. A typical case is the following. A young woman I was treating had, at a critical moment, a dream in which she was given a golden scarab. While she was telling me this dream, I sat with my head to the closed window. Suddenly I heard a noise behind me, like a gentle tapping. I turned around and saw a flying insect knocking against the window pane from outside. I opened the window and caught the creature in the air as it flew in. It was the nearest analogy to a golden scarab that one finds in our latitudes. A scarabid beetle, the common rose chafer, Cetonia arata, which, contrary to its usual habits, had evidently felt an urge to get into a dark room at this particular moment. At some point in his life, Jung became convinced that such phenomena transcended the realm of ordinary ESP, and that a more radical approach was needed to find a place for them in our mental outlook. In his lecture to the English SPR, SPR stands for Society for Psychical Research, in 1919, he had denied the existence of, quote, real spirits and maintained that this whole territory was an appendix to psychology. But when the lecture was reprinted in his collected works in 1947, he appended a footnote to this passage. After collecting psychological experiences from many people and many countries for 50 years, I no longer feel as certain as I did in 1919 when I wrote this sentence. To put it bluntly, I doubt whether an exclusively psychological approach can do justice to the phenomena in question. Not only the findings of parapsychology, but my own theoretical reflections outlined in On the Nature of the Psyche have led me to certain postulates which touch on the realms of nuclear physics and the whole conception of this space-time continuum. This opens up the whole question of the trans-psychic reality immediately underlying the psyche. Section 4. At about the time when this was written, Jung was working, in collaboration with Pauli, on his treatise on synchronicity, an eight-causal connecting principle, which was published together with Pauli's essay on Kepler in one volume. This was evidently meant as a symbolic act, one of the greatest physicists of the century joining forces with one of its greatest psychologists. The result was a stimulating exercise in unorthodox speculation, but at the same time, sadly disappointing. It did not amount to a theory in the proper sense, but rather to a universal schema, both very bold and very vague. Jung's treatise hinges on his concept of synchronicity. He defines it as, quote, the simultaneous occurrence of two meaningfully but not causally connected events, or alternatively as, 
quote, a coincidence in time of two or more causally unrelated events which have the same or similar meaning, equal in rank to causality as a principle of explanation. This is an almost verbatim repetition of Commerce's definition of seriality as, quote, a recurrence of the same or similar things or events in time or space, end quote. Events which, as far as can be ascertained, quote, are not connected by the same acting cause, end quote. The main difference appears to be that Commer emphasizes serial happenings in time, though, of course, he includes contemporaneous coincidences in space, whereas Young's concept of synchronicity seems to refer only to simultaneous events, although he includes precognitive dreams, which occurred sometimes several days before the events. He tried to get around the time paradox by saying that the unconscious mind functions outside of the physical framework of space-time. Thus, precognitive experiences are, quote, evidently not synchronous, but are synchronistic, since they are experienced as psychic images in the present, as though the objective event already existed. End quote. One wonders why Jung created these unnecessary complications by coining a term which implies simultaneity and then explaining that it does not mean what it means. But this kind of obscurity combined with verbosity runs through much of Jung's writing. Although Kammer's seriality and Jung's synchronicity are as similar as a pair of gloves, each fits one hand only. Kammer confined himself to analogies and naive physical terms, rejecting ESP and mentalistic explanations. Jung went to the opposite extreme and tried to explain all phenomena which could not be accounted for in terms of physical causality as manifestations of the unconscious mind. Quote, Synchronicity is a phenomenon that seems to be primarily connected with psychic conditions, that is to say, with processes in the unconscious, end quote. Its deepest strata, according to Jungian terminology, are formed by the, quote, collective unconscious, potentially shared by all members of the race. The decisive factors in the collective unconscious are the archetypes which constitute its structure. They are, as it were, the distilled memories of the human species, but cannot be represented in verbal terms, only in elusive symbols shared by all mythologies. They also provide patterns of behavior. For all human beings in archetypical situations, confrontations with death, danger, love, conflict, etc., in such situations, the unconscious archetypes invade consciousness, carrying strong emotions and, owing perhaps to the archetypes' indifference to physical space and time, facilitate the occurrence of synchronistic events. The appearance of the scarab while the patient was telling her archetypical dream is considered by Jung as an illustration of this nexus. The same applies to the detonations in Freud's bookcase during Jung's visit indicating the explosive nature of their father-son relationship. Quote, meaningful coincidences, which are to be distinguished from meaningless chance groupings, therefore seem to rest on an archetypical foundation, at least all the cases in my experience, and there is a large number of them, show this characteristic, end quote. Elsewhere in the essay he writes, synchronistic events rest, on the simultaneous occurrence of two different psychic states, one of them is normal, probable state. In other words, the one that is causally explicable, and the other, the critical experience, is the one that cannot be derived causally from the first. In the case of sudden death, the critical experience cannot be recognized immediately as extra-sensory perception, but can only be verified as such afterwards. In all these cases, whether it is a question of spatial or of temporal ESP, we find a simultaneity of the normal or ordinary state with another state or experience, which is not causally derivable from it, and whose objective existence can only be verified afterwards. An unexpected mental content which is directly or indirectly connected with some objective external event coincides with the ordinary psychic state. This is what I call synchronicity. 
The obscurity of these and similar passages indicates the apparently insurmountable difficulties of breaking away from our ingrained habits of thinking in terms of cause and effect. Commerer started with an intuitive conviction of the existence of a causal forces in the universe and landed up with his spurious physical analogies. Jung, starting from the same premise as Commerer, ended up with the confused notion that his archetypes somehow engineered the detonations in the bookcase or the scarab's appearance at the window. To resolve this paradox, he postulated that the archetypes were psychophysical entities, quote, psychoids, end quote, whose, quote, Transpsychic reality, end quote, may produce not only detonations, but also ghosts. See the note revoking his earlier disbelief in the existence of real spirits. Asterisk. See also the comments of one of his close collaborators, Aniela Hafe. Quote, the postulate of an imperceivable psychoid background world colors the initial problem of ghosts only to this extent. Jung could no longer maintain with assurance that these apparitions are projections of psychic complexes. Jung expressed himself very cautiously in his preface to the German edition of Stuart Edward White's The Unobstructed Universe. Although, on the one hand, our critical arguments throw doubt on every single case of apparitions, there is, on the other hand, not a single argument which could disprove the existence of ghosts. In this regard, therefore, we must probably content ourselves with a non liquid and asterisks. In the same breath, he wrote, we must completely give up the idea of psyches being somehow connected with the brain and remember instead the meaningful or intelligent behavior of the lower organisms which are without a brain. Here, we find ourselves much closer to the formal factor which, as I have said, has nothing to do with brain activity, end quote. The term formal factor refers to a presumed archetypical consciousness in the amoeba, but this could hardly justify the denial of a connection between human consciousness and the human brain. It is painful to watch how a great mind trying to disentangle himself from the causal chains of materialistic science gets entangled in its own verbiage. Kammerer and Young, in their different ways, fell into the same trap. Whitehead called it misplaced concreteness. Like theologians who start from the premise that the mind of God is beyond human understanding and then proceed to explain how the mind of God works, they postulated an a-causal principle and proceeded to explain it in pseudo-causal terms. How Pauli reacted to all this, we can only guess. He must have realized that Jung's theory of the archetype as a deus ex machina was a non-starter. But apart from tutoring Jung in theoretical physics, of which in the end Jung made little use, it seems unlikely that Pauli had much influence on Jung's paper. Asterisk. One wonders whether anybody else had, and whether Jung himself had even read the proofs. If he had, it remains incomprehensible that he did not amend the flat nonsense about there being no connection between mind and brain. Pauli's own essay, Turning the Mental Evolution of Kepler into a Paradigm of the Limitations of Science, is a model of clarity in sharp contrast to Jung's meanderings. Asterisk. Pauli's essay is, as we remember, called The Influence of Archetypal Ideas on the Scientific Theories of Kepler, but he uses the word archetypal in its classic, platonic meaning, as Kepler himself did, and not in the way Jung abused it. But the comparison is not quite fair because it is, as we have seen, much easier for a modern physicist than for a psychologist to get out of the grooves of causality, matter, space-time, and other traditional categories of thought. The physicist has been trained to regard the world as experienced by our senses as an illusion, Eddington's shadow desk covered by the veil of Maya. But that does not worry him unduly, because he has created a world of his own, described in a language of great beauty and power, the language of mathematical equations, which tells him all he knows and can ever hope to know of the universe around him. Bertrand Russell did not mean to be ironical when he wrote, quote, Physics is mathematical not because we know so much about the physical world, but because we know so little. It is only its mathematical properties that we can discover, end quote. Thus, the physicist was able to discard one by one all common sense ideas of what the world is like without suffering any traumatic shock. Asterisk. 
C.F. Jeans, quote, the history of physical science in the 20th century is one of progressive emancipation from the purely human angle of vision, end quote. One by one, matter, energy, and causality were dethroned, but the physicist was richly compensated by being able to play around with such enticing Gretchens as the neutrino and with such exhilarating notions as time flowing backward, ghost particles of negative mass, and atoms of radium spontaneously emitting beta radiation without physical cause. Pauli's revolutionary proposal was to extend the principle of non-causal events from microphysics, where its legitimacy was recognized, to macrophysics, where it was not. This is why I said that he was more radical in his approach than his colleagues. He probably hoped that, by joining forces with Jung, they would be able to work out some macrophysical theory which made some sense of paranormal events. The attempt was frustrated by deeply ingrained traditions in Western thought, which go all the way back to the Greeks. Like Kammer, Jung kept relapsing into spurious causal explanations to make the a-causal principle work. They were both ensnared, as Western man has been for 2,000 years, in the logical categories of Greek philosophy, which permeate our vocabulary and concepts and decide for us what is thinkable and what is unthinkable. As Sidney Hooks said, quote, when Aristotle drew up his table of categories, which to him represented the grammar of existence, he was really projecting the grammar of the Greek language on the cosmos, end quote. It is that grammar which became the undoing of Kammer and Young, together with a host of others who had embarked on a similar quest. The literature of parapsychology is full of hopeful theories which in fact, and for the same reason, were doomed to failure from the beginning. In Young's case, there is a particular irony because he spent the best part of his life in attempting to translate another untranslatable language into the Western universe of discourse that of Eastern mysticism. Looking back at the rise and decline of Jungian psychology, it does not seem to have fared better than his theory of non-synchronous synchronicity, but that is a subject beyond the scope of this book. The upshot of the treatise was a diagram on which Jung says he and Pauli, quote, finally agreed. It looks like this. I'll put it up on the screen. Jung offers no concrete explanations how the schema is meant to work, and his comments on it are so obscure that I must leave it to the interested reader to look them up in the library. One cannot help being reminded of the biblical mountain whose labors gave birth to a mouse, but it was quite a symbolic mouse nevertheless. It was for the first time in the history of modern thought that the hypothesis of a causal factors working in the universe was given the joint stamp of respectability by a psychologist and a physicist of international renown. Section 5. There has been in recent years a large crop of other explanatory hypotheses regarding paranormal phenomena. Physicists have played with parallel universes, with Einstein's curved space, with two-dimensional time and tunnels in hyperspace, which would permit direct contact between regions separated in normal space by astronomical distances. Among psychologists, Freud once he became convinced of telepathic contact between analyst and patient, theorized that ESP was an archaic method of communication between individuals which was later supplanted by the more efficient method of sensory communication, asterisk. Freud was a member of both the British and the American Society for Psychical Research, and in 1924 wrote to Ernest Jones that he was prepared to, quote, lend the support of psychoanalysis to the matter of telepathy, end quote. But Jones feared that this would discredit psychoanalysis and dissuaded Freud from any public gesture. He also prevented Freud from reading at the International Psychoanalytic Congress in 1922 an essay he had prepared on, quote, psychoanalysis and telepathy. It was only published after Freud's death. Among biologists, a remarkable theory was proposed by Sir Alistair Hardy, who thought that the highly skilled and coordinated activities of some lower animals, such as the foraminifera, could only be explained by a kind of group mind where each individual shared, quote, a psychic blueprint. 
Among the philosophers, professors Broad and Price have produced challenging mentalistic hypotheses, asterisk. For a summary of these and other explanatory theories, see, for instance, Rosalind Haywood's The Sixth Sense, London, 1959. Lastly, among mathematicians, G. Spencer Brown proposed an intriguing theory which attempted to explain the anti-chance results in card-guessing experiments by questioning the validity of the concept of chance itself. Spencer Brown claimed that by matching pairs of digits at random, where the first digit symbolized the guess and the second the target card, he obtained a significantly higher number of hits than chance expectation. However, he did not publish his actual tables and did not claim that his results were of a comparable magnitude to the astronomical anti-chance odds obtained by the ESP experimenters. The controversy petered out inconclusively, but it nevertheless provided food for thought. Asterisk. Spencer Brown first published his theory in Nature, July 25, 1953. Statistical Significance in Psychical Research, and followed it up in a book, Probability and Scientific Inference, London, 1957. See also Rosalind Haywood's brief comment in The Sixth Sense, page 169, footnote. Unlike the propounders of the conspiracy of fraud theory, Spencer Brown admitted that the ESP experiments were, quote, well-designed and rigorously controlled. He accepted the results at face value, but thought that they pointed to some anomaly in the very concept of randomness, though he did not elaborate on the nature of this suspected anomaly, which was to explain the disproportionately high number of hits in ESP experiments, his ideas bear a close resemblance to Commer's concept of seriality. The law of the series is in fact the reciprocal of the concept of randomness. It is interesting to note that it was Sir Alistair Hardy, a pioneer of ESP research, who provided the grant for Spencer Brown's research, Hardy commented. It remained for Mr. G. Spencer Brown of Trinity College, Cambridge, to suggest the alternative and simpler hypothesis that all this experimental work in so-called telepathy, clairvoyance, precognition, and psychokinesis, which depends upon obtaining results above chance, may be really a demonstration of some single and very different principle. He believes that it may be something no less fundamental or interesting, but not telepathy or these other curious things, something implicit in the very nature and meaning of randomness itself. Whether or not the majority of card-guessing experiments may be shown to be due to something quite different from telepathy, there is, to my mind, quite sufficient evidence to prove the existence of a true form of telepathy, which seems likely to be of considerable biological significance. In passing, let me say that if most of this apparent card-guessing and dice-influencing work should in fact turn out to be something very different, it will not, I believe, have been a wasted effort. It will have provided a wonderful mine of material for the study of a very remarkable new principle. That new principle, let me repeat it, looks remarkably like Commer's Law of the Series, postulated in 1919. None of the explanatory theories mentioned earlier embraces the whole field of paranormal phenomena. Some accept telepathy, but draw the line at clairvoyance, precognition, or PK. And even those ultras who accept apparitions in some form of life after death are reluctant to attack the roots of coincidence, although we stumble upon them all the time. I have singled out for discussion commerce, seriality, and young Polly's synchronicity because they are, to the best of my knowledge, the only theories of the paranormal which do attack the problem of meaningful coincidences. This has been an excerpt from The Roots of Coincidence by Arthur Kessler, Chapter 3, Seriality and Synchronicity, narrated by Joseph Vogel.